Actually, I'll respond, Dahlia, to, to you and your challenge about which of these various configurations is at play. Uh, the, I think all of the above is probably the right answer. Uh, what's going to determine which one we're in? It's got something to do with the issues that are involved. The cases I'm going to be talking about later today include some unanimous opinions and near unanimous opinions. On the other hand, this shadow docket set of cases in the COVID uh, cases really show us how the 5-4 operates, as, as Paul said. So, so what makes this one fall into the 5-4? One of the places I think it's fair to predict you're going to see the biggest impact of this growingly conservative court is in the area of religious freedom. This is clearly a major issue and part of the program for some of the most conservative justices. And so the articulation of this most favored nation status for religion uh, really takes hold in the shadow doctrine. Likely you'll see that now go over to the merits doctrine in, in future cases. Other thing I would mention, and this was clearly mentioned in a very uh, vigorous dissent by Justice Kagan, it's not just the, that the most favored nation status that the court is using that says if you do something for anyone else, you've got to do that for religion. She was not the swearing cheerleader, um, and that, that's what raised the, uh, what turns out to be one of the most significant campus free speech cases uh, in years, uh, arguably since the celebrated Tinker against Des Moines Independent Community School District case in 1969. Tinker best known for the, uh, the celebrated language that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. But of course, what Tinker also did is it gave schools the right and it recognized a special interest of schools to regulate free uh, speech and expression in certain instances, those instances, and I'm quoting here, that materially disrupt classwork or involve substantial disorder or invasion of the rights of others. So that's the background. Is Tinker going to apply here? And let's talk about what happened in a, it's not armbands the way to protest as it was in Tinker. Uh, this is a cheerleader who got uh, knocked off or did not make the varsity cheerleading squad. So over the weekend and away from school, uh, she posted a picture of herself on Snapchat with the caption of effing school, effing softball, effing cheer, effing everything. And for those of you who are wondering whether I was going to say effing or something else, you now know the answer. Uh, she, of course, did not use effing, but, but spelled it all the way out. Uh, after finding out about the post, uh, school officials suspended her uh, from the softball team for a year for violating uh, school rules and team rules. She sued the school claiming that the suspension violated her First Amendment rights. She won in both the district court and in the Court of Appeals, the Third Circuit. Third Circuit, uh, taking this up uh, a higher notch, it went much further than the district court. The district court granted summary judgment, citing Tinker, uh, and finding that her Snapchat post did not cause a substantial disruption at school, and therefore it reverts back to that protection uh, not being shed at the schoolhouse gates. The Third Circuit affirmed the judgment, but held that Tinker... Uh, that part of Tinker that allows the regulation of expression does not apply at all uh, because schools uh, are limited at the schoolhouse gate and there's no special line, uh, license for schools to regulate off-campus speech. Now, this, of course, raised a concern for many of us, and that's a big piece of the ADL brief here, uh, because it would limit schools' ability to regulate uh, cyberbullying uh, or other kinds of activity that is, takes place physically off campus, but has an impact on campus, including, for example, uh, academic integrity issues. The court, in an 8-1 opinion uh, issued by, uh, authored by Justice Breyer, uh, affirmed the holding for the student, but rejected the Third Circuit's approach, saying that while public schools do have a special interest in regulating some off-campus speech, the schools cited special interest in this case uh, of promoting good manners, preventing disruption, uh, were not sufficient to overcome the student's interest in free speech. The court said that a school's special interest in regulating on-campus speech does not always disappear when that speech physically takes place off campus, as it did here. However, there are three features that the court mentioned in particular with respect to this off-campus, physically off-campus speech or expression. Uh, first, off-campus speech normally falls within the purview of parents or family or guardians rather than the school to be regulating. Um, second, off-campus speech regulations could cover virtually everything that a student has the right to do or say. And finally, that, uh, that the school has an interest in protecting 
um, the a, a school a student's unpopular off campus expression, um, because the free marketplace of ideas is a cornerstone of a representation of our democracy schools playing a major role in representation representation of our democracy. Using that framework, Justice Breyer said that her interest in free expression, the student's interest in free expression, outweighed the school's interest in regulating her speech here. Uh, the Snapchat post constituted criticism, in fact, uh, directed towards the school, which would primarily fall within the scope of the First Amendment. It may not be the way in which most of us would express that criticism, but clearly it was her way, very poignantly, of making that criticism. The context of the speech, uh, from her personal cell phone, off campus, and over the weekend uh, diminished the school's interest in punishing her and regulating her expression. Looking at the school's argument that it was promoting good manners and punishing vulgar speech, the court noted uh, it's really parents and not the school uh, who have the primary responsibility over weekend and away from school conduct. The post, although it was the subject of much discussion on school, really it was just for a few days. It clearly upset some students, but it did not cause, according to Justice Breyer, that kind of substantial disruption that was envisioned in Tinker. And finally, Justice Breyer uh, answers the question we're all thinking, uh, because it's hard not to describe this case in somewhat uh, comical terms because of the nature of it. He says, no, but don't fall into that trap. He said, it might be tempting to dismiss the plaintiff's words as unworthy of robust First Amendment protection, but sometimes it's necessary to protect the superfluous in order to preserve the necessary. It's only one dissent in this case is Justice Thomas, who takes the position that schools historically have had the authority to regulate off-campus speech, so long as it is an approximate tendency to harm the school. He felt that this fell into that category. He would have regulated it. Justice Breyer writing for eight justices on the court took a different view. Sanchez in, against uh, Mayorkas is a unanimous opinion by Justice Kagan, 9-0. It's a fairly technical statutory opinion, but it could have a very significant impact on the lives of a lot of people. Uh, the court held that an individual who entered the United States unlawfully is not eligible to become a lawful permanent resident, even if he or she had been granted temporary protected status. Uh, technically, um, whether the uh, conferral of temporary protected status, that uh, TPS status, um, constitutes an admission into the United States is the issue, uh, because you need to be admitted uh, into the United States to be eligible for consideration for permanent resident status. Petitioners in this case had come to the United States from El Salvador unlawfully in the 1990s. They successfully applied for temporary protected status uh, in 2001. Temporary protected status grants the ability for foreign nationals uh, to to stay where they come from a country with unusually dangerous conditions um, and the, uh, the allows them to live and to work in the United States while those condition, conditions exist. 2014 years later, they applied to become legal permanent residents. And the question was, was had they been admitted, which is what that statute requires, had they been admitted under the temporary protected uh, status law? The unanimous view of the court is that that admission of that or that uh, uh, grant of status under the temporary protected status law does not constitute an admission. An admission. This is a statutory matter, not a constitutional matter. Congress could change this if they wish to. Uh, as we look at it today, um, as many as 400,000 current TPS residents in the United States um, could be affected by this because right now they have entered the United States without authorization cannot seek permanent resident status because they have not technically been admitted. United States against Cooley, if you take out the context, sounds like a garden variety Fourth Amendment case. Police officer sees a truck pulled over to the side of the road. He goes over to see if he can help. He has suspicion that there's drugs in the car. Then he has suspicion that the owner of the car may be violent. Uh, he pulls his weapon. He does a search. He indeed finds drugs. He finds weapons. Um, what's our question? The question is the officer is a Native American on a public right of way in tribal land. And the individual who was searched, Cooley, is a non-Native American. United States, again, uh, Montana against the United States, 1981 case, uh, said that the tribes do lack inherent sovereign power to exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-tribal members, but they do exercise civil authority 
over the conduct of non-Indians on fee lands within its reservation when the conduct threatens or has some direct effect on the political integrity, economic security, or the health or welfare of the tribe. So a unanimous opinion by Justice Breyer applies that Montana against the United States doctrine and says, in this case, this tribal officer is permitted on tribal lands to use his authority to search, stop, and seize, in this case, uh, from a non-tribal member that actually leads to a federal prosecution on firearms uh, and drugs charges. Very hard to make these assessments, as Erwin cautioned us earlier, you know, based on one term and not even a full term of these particular nine. So it, it's a little hard to know. Uh, but, but there are a couple of observations that I think we can begin to tease out. Uh, one is that even within the six conservative justices, there, there are differences. One that we've talked about several times is Chief Justice Roberts is a somewhat more moderate conservative. Uh, probably putting the other five in the same category is probably oversimplifying a little bit. Uh, it does appear that Justice Kavanaugh is trying to probe for that position in the middle of the court. He's been observed to be the middle of the court ideologically, but it may well be uh, a position that he is very happy to, to have and to play that, that kind of a role. Um, in a different way, uh, Justice Kagan might've played that role, but now she's part of the three, not part of the, the six. So a little, little hard to say. Uh, one, one cautionary note, certainly uh, from some quick commentary that you see, this idea that now we have a court of three liberals, three conservatives and three sort of in the middle, um, way oversimplifies the fact that that doesn't make any of that group of six we've been talking about anything other than very conservative. We have three justices on the court now, referring to justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch, who would, any one of whom would be the most conservative justice on a, almost any court for the last 75 years. Um, the other three in that group, the Chief Justice um, and, uh, and Justices uh, uh, Kavanaugh, um, uh, you know, at that point, you uh, and, and Justice Barrett, um, We'll see how they play out, but they are very conservative by any objective measure. Just coming back to Melissa's uh, very good uh, look ahead to next term, we're going to learn a lot about how these justices line up on issues that are much more hot button. So a year from now, ask me the same question. We might have better information. I think what we can expect is a very conservative Supreme Court that's going to issue some very significantly conservative decisions in the next term. Um, I, I could obviously be wrong about that. Um, but I think this was the term that just concluded where the court might have tried to trim its sails somewhat coming off of two bruising confirmation hearings, but, but that, that's now behind us. Uh, they move into another year. The court cases that they've decided to take for next term do not look like a court that's looking to trim its sails. So to keep the metaphor going, I think we are sailing into the choppy waters, uh, and I think you will have a very conservative court issuing very conservative decisions on some very significant issues for the body politic.